Hello, CraftConf. How are we doing this fine afternoon? It's beautiful weather, right? I hope everyone's enjoying themselves at this fantastic conference. So my name is Justin Kitagawa, and I'm a platform leader at Twilio. I'm responsible for edge infrastructure and cloud orchestration. And I'm thrilled and honored to speak to you today about Twilio and platforms and how they unlock developer effectiveness there. Now, a show of hands, who's heard of Twilio? OK, that's good. Who's used Twilio? A little few less hands, right? Who stayed at like a, uh, an Airbnb or like ridden an Uber or Lyft or a Bolt or um, even kind of registered your phone with WhatsApp? More hands. So you've actually used Twilio because we power the communications via SMS and um, voice for those um, apps and use cases. For many, Twilio is known for their simple and easy to use SMS and voice APIs. We're a cloud communication platform built to fuel the future of communication. Our communication building blocks are like Lego blocks that are controlled programmatically via our simple and easy to use APIs. And we help companies, both big and small, revolutionize the way that they engage with their customers. Now, most of us know us for our SMS and voice and our recently acquired SendGrid acquisition, um, our email APIs. But we're more than that. We allow uh, omni-channel, omni meaning all, all channels, communication. So we have offerings like programmable video, which enable WebRTC and development of WebRTC applications, or autopilot, which power um, omni-channel AI bots, or Twilio Facts, Flex, which is our next generation cloud, commuting, um, cloud contact platform. Now, knowing all of this, I want you to answer silently, what does Twilio sell? We're going to answer that in a bit, OK? But let's move on. First, a history lesson. So let's uh, fire up the Flux capacitor and go back to like 2008. And this pizza box was the original burn down list that our founders um, used prior to launching Twilio. And for those that can't read on it, I mean, it's, it's scribbled, right? But you can see we have to make the screencast. We have to populate the blog. And we have to validate the links to our helper libraries. This pizza box sits in our office, and I love it. First off, I'm amazed that the CEO, Jeff, had the foresight to save the box, right? I mean, it's got like pizza grease on it, right? Like it can't, I mean, it's a fascinating, it just ended up in a recycling bin. Second, it's an homage to um, uh, one of the Twilio's core values, which is to draw the owl. Twilio is a company of doers, and this box is a symbol of it. The future has no instruction book. It's ours to write. Figure it out, ship it, and iterate. And lastly, it's a reminder that the future is built by developers like you and me. And it can start from the humblest of beginnings. Now, we had three co-founders, Jeff, who's now our CEO, John, who's a product architect for the company, and Evan, who's um, since left the company but has gone on to do great things. He worked for like, the Obama administration in like, um, a technical function. Now, Jeff built all of our, all of our co-founders are software engineers. So Jeff built was um, originally the, the X the X team, and it was basically kind of like our web components, so like the API and our billing systems. John built the core systems, which were our voice offerings. And then Evan built the I team. I standed for infrastructure, and it was our platform. Now, each of them coded in a different language. So they coded in PHP, Java, and Python. This was kind of like the original sin. Like this kind of from, from this, a lot of complexity kind of arrived. But effectively, each of them kind of built out a monolith in their respective languages, right? And oops, and then um, t um, which talked to a, a shared database. I kind of like mentioned this because oftentimes when we're starting a startup, we kind of like think that we have to kind of build a distributed system and so on and so forth. Not necessarily. A monolith is perfectly acceptable to kind of like build up front because it requires less coordination, right? And so um, it's a perfect way to start. And I almost kind of think that you should start with a monolith, and then you have to graduate to kind of like microservices. But that's where we are now. We have a microservice architecture with over 1,500 server, active server roles in production, over 15,000 hosts in nine, um, nine regions worldwide and 27 data centers. 
Now, before we go on, I want to take like an aside on talk about innovation, and in particular, like innovation and impact. So in 2013, I went to a QCon um, in San Francisco, and I had the good fortune of like listening to a story by Ronnie Kohavi. So he is now the GM and, uh, 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 of Bing. Um, and so in this case, he was talking about site links. And for those that don't know, site links are essentially the sublinks that you'll find when you kind of do a search on things, right? Now, this was an enormously expensive feature that was added to, uh, to Bing, right? Um, it took multiple man years, or person years, rather, to, to kind of like get this out. Because it not only was a huge engineering effort, but it was also an effort to kind of go and collect the data from um, users of Bing, right? But it had a big impact. Annual revenues in the first year of like 50 million. Now, there's another um, story that like, Ronnie kind of shared, and he said that there was like, a story that was on the backlog, and it sat there for six months. And there was kind of like debate between the product managers and the, like, the engineering about like, whether or not we, they should kind of go and implement it, right? Fed up, one in passionate engineer ended up like, um, implementing this feature over the weekend. On Monday morning, like, alarm bells started going off because too much money was coming in. That one feature brought in $100 million. So just think about that. Like there's like one, fe one feature that was able to be implemented over the weekend that didn't get implemented for six months. So the moral of the story here is like we don't necessarily know what to build. Oftentimes our perceptions of what to build are, are wrong. Or as kind of like the Wayne Gretzky's quote is, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. Now, uh, and I'm sorry, this is a, like a, a US metaphor, but it's often used um, when people are describing a product. People say, uh, hey, we, wanna, we want this product to be a home run or a grand slam. And so it's in reference to in baseball, um, a pitcher will throw a ball to, and then the, the batter has to hit the ball. And if you hit a home run, you hit the ball out of the ballpark. And if there were three people on base, well, four people can score. So at the maximum, the most people that could ever score from like a grand slam is four. So when you use this like metaphor, it's actually not correct because in reality, what happens if like a hit could actually yield 10 runs or 100 runs or 1,000 or a million? And that's what software can do. And so in that light, what you really want to do, it changes the calculus. You want to maximize the number of at-bats which is why Twilio emphasizes ships. We even have like a badge, ship it, right? And when I mean ship, I mean shipping code into production and getting it into the hands of our customers. And as a leader of like internal platforms, I'm driven to reduce our lead time or the amount of time it takes from an idea or concept to get out into the hands of our customers. And I'd like to share an incredible ship for us. At Signal in uh, 2016, um, lucky winners it, during the keynote, found a glowing orb underneath their seats. The glowing orbs were powered by Twilio Wireless, and it was the introduction of our first pilot program. So Twilio Wireless is an IoT offering that offers cellular connectivity for IoT devices, and it's meant to solve like the last mile. So uh, normally IoT devices have uh, like Bluetooth or Wi-Fi, but what happens if you're like in a um, need farm equipment or if you're in a car? and such, right? IoT, uh, Twilio Wireless is meant to solve that um, use case. It's used in um, e-scooters and e-bikes like Lime in the United States, or System One. This is a, a manufacturer that goes and um, has uh, uh, chips that go out and detect um, medical equipment and report back if there's any issues. Now, I want to ask you, kind of considering what this is, and now this is like a, a, a full business unit at Twilio, how many people do you think kind of took to kind of go make that pilot? Five, three, and it was actually one product manager, the business dev, and one software engineer. Like, how is that possible? Well, it's not an accident, it's not a miracle, and it's not luck, it's by design. And it's a result of our small teams and self-service platforms. So organizationally, we have an engineering philosophy like Amazon and Netflix. And uh, we believe that this gives us an organizational advantage. We have 120 engineering teams that are effectively mini startups at Twilio. And each team kind of owns a certain piece of the larger Twilio puzzle. Each team has a mission and an area of responsibility. 
and they're two pizza teams. So uh, this is an Amazon concept that a, a team has to be fed by a kind of two pizzas. Now, their characteristics are that they're autonomous. We strive to minimize centralized planning, and we emphasize bottom-up um, empowerment. So each team owns their own backlogs. They're customer-focused, so they're directly responsible and know about kind of like what their customers need and want. And they're also metrics-driven. These are oftentimes like um, two terms that are like used with the distributed systems, but we look at this organizationally as well. Um, when we want to bring up new functionality, we just spin up a new team, and so we can kind of horizontally scale our engineering core, right? And in loosely coupled, what we mean is that we value APIs over meetings. So the way that teams interface with each other are via APIs. Um, when teams get big, so like each team is owning their services, they'll go through an organizational mitosis. And so what this means is that a team, like for instance that initial voice team, first split into like two teams, and then now there are like 10 teams that represent the full perspective of kind of like um, what Twilio Voice is. So let's go back to our like team structure a bit. We have vertical teams and we have horizontal teams. And our vertical teams, uh, some examples of these are like our voice and messaging. And this is a simplification. There's really like 10 voice teams and 10 messaging teams, but they basically own a subset of our customer facing end to end. And then we have horizontal teams. And these horizontal teams are what we call our platform teams. And they represent functionality that is used across the board for the vertical teams. We have a very, very a strong DevOps culture. When we say uh, DevOps, we don't mean a role. There are no like engineers that are DevOps engineers. What this means is that we have software engineers and they're doing DevOps functions. And what we mean is like you build it, you run it. So each team owns and operates their own services. There's no centralized QA, build, or release teams in a traditional sense. Teams build, test, and release themselves from services that platform teams build for them. And we do this because we believe it aligns incentives and, and creates accountability. We're very operationally focused. We have a saying that job number one is operations and security. Job two is everything else. If a team isn't meeting their SLOs, KPIs, or SLAs, they should be fixing their service. They shouldn't be building bright, shiny features. Our entire organization is aligned around this, and why? This goes back to what we sell. We sell trust. And for people to trust us, we have to be up and running. And in engineering, we really value uh, agility with resiliency. So 100 is like the average number of production deployments we do per day. Um, every two days is when we are releasing a new feature to our end customer. In terms of like five nines, uh, this is our API uptime um, SLO. And so just to put this in perspective, four nines is 53 minutes um, a year, right? 4.4 minutes a, a month. Um, five nines is five minutes per year, 26 seconds per month. And then we have five nines of, of, su uh, of success rate for our uh, API as well. And so that means one error in every 100,000 requests. Now, these are like um, uh, impressive statistics and such, right? But it always, hasn't always been like sunshine and rainbows at Twilio. So four years ago, um, we had imperative infrastructure as code. Engineers used to be, require um, chef expertise to get their services shipped. And they used a DSL checked into Git to drive deployments. We had a consultative platform. So the platform acted as consultants to help engineers onboard various platform services. And while this may sound that good, it wasn't. Um, our core deployment system was falling over. We had 264,500s in a quarter for like our deployment system. And outside of kind of like being two nines and it just kind of like being a, 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 um, not meeting our SLO, this had a real impact in that our teams could not deploy code. It was viewed as like a, a huge risk to the company. It was a narrow mark by gatekeepers. So in the name of protecting the platform or saving engineers from themselves, platform acted as gatekeepers. The dreaded I request or JIRA ticket that got routed for manual execution by a platform team was viewed as a roadblock um, across the organization. It was an era of a lack of empathy. Platform teams didn't use the platform they were building for the engineers. This is actually a surprising anti-pattern that I see frequently. Some team is kind of like building something but not using it themselves. It was an era of like vendor sprawl. Teams were intimately aware of all of our vendors and tooling. And I'll posit a question to you. If every team has to become a, Je a Jenkins expert, 
are you really, is the platform helping the users, or are you distributing the platform's dis, um, responsibilities to the rest of the organization? In short, our platform was broken. But we made a philosophical shift. We went and determined that moving forward, our platform was going to be API first. It was going to value self-service over gatekeepers, declarative platform over an imperative one, and that we were going to be uh, building with empathy. So let me kind of dive into what this means. API first. We're an API company. The API is our control plane. Um, SLIs and U, uh, um, CLIs and UIs are powered by our APIs. Git and SEMs are not our control plane. An API is. And in the form, uh, the API is either a REST API or some web-based API, either server-side or local host as a daemon that's running on, the, on, on VMs. If anyone here has ever had to like, refactor their platform, you know that having a strong interface is critical to this. Five years ago, we didn't have an interface into our service discovery system. And there were five different um, entry points that could have been hacked. And sure enough, there are five different points that were hacked. So it's been a long process to kind of just go and consolidate, kind of like make an interface and such, right? So publish an interface, and, um, and API force, forces that. It allows us to have vendor indirection so that we, um, we don't want our engineers coding directly to our vendors. We want them to be coding to a, a, a proxy that sits in between. It's polyglot friendly. Remember I spoke about like, that we had three different languages that we have to speak to, right? So in so far as this, with, uh, when we do have client libraries, we make sure they're very thin libraries that are talking to um, either the sidecar or, or web-based APIs. And it also allows us to have consistency on our control plane. We can roll out a working platform constantly, just as um, when you go into like AWS or, or, or Google Cloud. Self-service over gatekeepers is probably one of our most important tenants. Um, Jeff Bezos, in a 2011 uh, letter to shareholders, stated, I'm emphasizing the self-service -nature, self nature of these platforms because it's important for a reason that's somewhat non-obvious. Even well-meaning gatekeepers slow innovation. When a platform is self-service, even the improbable ideas get tried because there's no expert gatekeeper ready to say that will never work. It's vital to kind of allow um, developers to maintain their flow. You know this as you're kind of like coding. You just want to be able to work. You don't want to be um, interrupted by a context switch or having to contact somebody on Slack to kind of like move forward. Naturally, automation comes up, but I um, urge you not to um, fall into the automation fallacy of like that's if it's scripted, that it's automated. If you have to contact another team or it can only be executed on a certain Jenkins server by a certain user, it's not automated in my book because it's not self-service. And uh, declarative over imperative means um, the what over the how. We prefer our platform's users to declare what they want to achieve, rather how they are going to achieve it. This can also be thought of as data models over code. We prefer users to represent their end state in terms of data models um, instead of imperatively how they're going to kind of go and get that. The how is codified into the platform. This removes the burden from our users. They don't need to know all the steps to how to get from A to B. They just know, need to know they have to get to B. And why do we do this? Um, Unknown unknowns. Users don't necessarily know how they, the best practices of how to kind of achieve their goals. And they're often naive in their implementations up front. And it allows us to have evolving best practices. So as we kind of gain better insight into how to do things, we can automatically inject it into, into the way they do it. Now, let's take a look at how some of these tenants um, are manifested. The Twilio API. We do billions of um, API requests uh, a week and hundreds of thousands kind of per day, right? And they all come through um, a service called Starship. It's an edge-federated API gateway that transforms um, um, API requests. It's also responsible for um, enforcing uh, um, authorization, um, uh, account uh, auth authentication, and concurrency limits. So in this, remember the kind of the full stacks that each of the team is running, right? And then we have an API in front. And this is the strangler kind of pattern here, right? So when we first developed the monolith, this is how we started to break this up into microservices. So when an API request comes in, they all come in through Starship. And from its route, we can determine that, like, hey, we're going to kind of give this down to voice. Or the next request comes in, and we know that that's going to go to a, a messaging endpoint. Now, in the past, API was a consulting team. So anytime a new API had to be um, surfaced, uh, 
teams had to engage with the API team to code the Python that got loaded into, um, um, into Starship. It led to statements of work, and lead time was on the order of weeks to months. Before Signal, this created a lot of challenge. But we moved to a declarative API model, and in the form of API definitions. So an API definition is essentially like a JSON file that has um, essentially all the information about the API. So it contains information about the location, enums of a particular REST um, endpoint, the properties of that endpoint, and um, metadata for the actions on that resource. What this did is it enabled self-service. Now, with some toolings and a CD pipeline, definitions are loaded into Starship and compiled and executed by the end teams. End teams are able to kind of like go and change this. There's no more gatekeepers. We have improved security. Because we have um, strict metadata about like what our API should be, we, can't, we won't leak API data. So sometimes what happens is teams will either have um, alternate methods on APIs or other properties on resources that are for internal use. We make sure that doesn't get leaked out to the end customers. And it also enables self-service refactoring. So if anyone's ever had to like refactor a web application um, that is um, live and do it with like no downtime, it's kind of like this, which is an insane um, GIF here. Like they're literally changing the tire on the car while it's like moving. So what we have is a process called shadow. So when a request comes in, first off, let's take voice and say that we have voice v1 and the new newer version voice v2. As request comes in. We split the request, and we send it to both endpoints. And then when we, they return back, we can take the diff of the responses, keep track of like whether or not um, that we have 100% fidelity, and then send the request back out. Now, once the, we've determined that the API is safe to go, we also have a facility that's enabled self-service called Switch. And so in Switch, we're able to feature flag and say, hey, customer A, you're going to the old API, and customer B, you're going to the new API. Another challenge that we had in the past is helper library drift. So whenever you introduce a new API, they have to end up getting um, into these uh, six different helper libraries. And historically, they're all artisanally maintained and handcrafted. And so what would happen is that oftentimes, APIs wouldn't be uh, projected out onto the respective um, AP, um, helper libraries. Well, now that we have uh, API definitions, we can auto-generate libraries. So we have a project called YoYoDyne, and in YoYoDyne, we can take the JSON, and in this case, let's take a look at like, the enums, right? And then this is the actual um, Java code of like, the, the resource here, and you can see how it's like, transpiled and transposed onto this Java class, or here into kind of like the Python class. So now what happens is every week we're able to generate the helper libraries and we get out like the freshest and latest APIs out to our customers in, 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 in real time. Now let's talk about how we um, do this with Twilio deployments. So if you can focus one thing with your company, I would recommend that you really focus on how do you make your deployments safe, easy, and reliable. It's your biggest bang for the buck. We require first like uh, no downtime like on our deployments, right? And we're in AWS, and so we, ha we always have to assume that we have disposable infrastructure. So we do not like have long-lived VMs that we replace software onto. We do red-black deployments. So here is like kind of like an N-tier application, and all of our service kind of have a subset of this kind of like architecture here, right? And so we'll, we'll sometimes have, uh, for load balancers, we'll use the host of um, load balancing products that are available, uh, Drop Wizard, Flask, and PHP for our application tier. We use Memcached, Redis, and Elasticache. And then um, S MySQL, Cassandra, and Dynamo for backends. Now, not every server uses all these stacks, but in general, this is just how to think of it, right? So whenever we do a deployment, we only do one layer of the cake at a time. So if we have one particular version of, of services application tier, we'll only replace that layer at the given time. And so let's say we start at like version three, this red black deployment, we spin up new VMs with version four, then we'll bring in a canary so that we test out and make sure that that like server is going okay, and then we'll just circuit break, and then we can just cut over to like version four. Now, if anything comes up, so like let's say after an hour we detect that there's some issue and so on and so forth, we can just cut the load balancer back um, um, as so. 
okay, in the past, we used to have like imperative deployments. So we had given the small building blocks to like boot a host and put a load balancer in, right? And it really wasn't doing anything for end engineers. So then we built a confusing DSL. And this was a Turing complete DSL. And it became so confusing that like even the orchestration team members who maintain this code couldn't easily tell how many servers were supposed to be deployed into any environment because you'd have to execute the interpreter to kind of like determine what your end state was, right? And the other thing was that we had a Git control plane. So checking into Git and committing it would actually, and, and, and pushing it to master would kind of go and like and trigger this um, things out, right? But we ended up moving to a declarative um, uh, deployment model. So what's in a deployment? We're a 12 factor, we adhere to like 12 factor applications, right? So in a deployment we have software, hardware, and configuration. Our software is a manifest, and the manifest has basically, um, uh, the, what is the artifact that we're gonna be deploying? The list of artifacts and the versions that are gonna be deployed. And then there's hardware, and that is a, a representation or an abstraction we call a formation. And so this has um, how many instances are things, what instance types are gonna be deployed, right? And then configuration is externalized configuration. Think of like an immutable artifact that's pushed through the environments. Configuration is the um, externalized configuration that is injected into the server at, um, at boot time. They're all available by APIs. And then they're all available in our um, platform console. So this is just a, um, a, a GIF here that kind of shows how you do a deployment, right, in, uh, at Twilio. And so you can kind of go, and then here in the manifest, you'll see that like we're just gonna be, um, in this case, um, loading a manifest of box config Java server, a particular version, right? We're gonna go add that, and then we'll go to the formation here, and we're gonna go choose um, a T2 medium, and then we're gonna have 10 instances, and we said, no, we're gonna just have five. And all of these are kind of, we do the right thing. So by default, we always have to make sure that we have three instances because every service has to be deployed into three availability zones. So this way, if any availability zone goes down, um, that your, your service is protected. But once again, it's kind of like, you just specify what you want, we're gonna go out and execute this. And behind the scenes, there's a convergence engine that's kind of like working to converge the environment with reality. We also like are big fans of MySQL and we require zero downtime on our MySQL deployments. So with our MySQL uh, clusters, right, we have our primaries, we have replicas that are, the replicas, once again, are in all the availability zones, analytics, backups, and monitors. Um, the primaries stream um, data to th um, things. In the event of a, a schema change, we actually apply the schema change to our replica. Um, we will never apply a schema change to like um, uh, the primary, because that can like lock up the database and, and so on and so forth, right? So, it's, it's um, the deployment itself we use, um, we modified a script called um, um, MySQL HA, and we use that, and it, it's very reliable, but it would also require a semi-manual MySQL deployments that our team members had to babysit. And so we had one team that was had a lot of MySQL servers, and they basically had two engineers that were just constantly babysitting these deployments. So now we, put into Admiral and behind the declarative API, right? And so in this, you can just see, once again, we're gonna go add um, in, a, in our manifest. If you wanna do a schema change, you basically just add a package with a schema change that will get executed. And then in here, you'll choose your deployment strategy. You'll specify like how many instances you want of your replicas and so on and so forth, right? And how you wanted to do that. These are the simulated events to see kind of like what is gonna happen with an instance, right? And you just hit deploy and off you go. When we released this, uh, this was like a Slack um, kind of like message that we got from like our team members. Um, oh, I'm, gee, is this true? I'm gonna cry. And we got like, the adoption on this was like staggering. Within two months, we had like 90% of all of like my SEO clusters had kind of come onto this, right? So last year we had 1,300 uh, MySQL deployments and we had zero critical incidents as a result of like those deployments. Finally, let's talk about like a service mesh, and I talk about how like um, declarative it works with a service mesh. So remember this kind of like setup that we're switching and our IPs are constantly shifting and changing. As a result of this, we, um, uh, we have a service mesh, right? And our existing service mesh is kind of like a legacy service mesh, right? But we have like HA proxy, and if service A wants to talk to service B, it's talking through HA proxy. 
never talks directly to it. It's basically, think of this as like a local host load balancer that's sitting on each uh, a VM or container pod. Um, connects up to our, our service discovery and any, it, get, it listens for any events um, um, with regards to kind of like VM shifting. Um, we have Nginx that kind of sits in front, so that's kind of like the ingress on each of the services, right? So this is kind of just like what it looks like on every box in the Twilio cl cluster, right? Right now, it's like a, uh, it currently is like a, a, a configuration beast. You have to like um, uh, configure things in three different spots, right? And it just creates a lot of mental load when somebody just wants to say like, hey, I just want to basically connect to that role downstream. So that's why we're kind of like moving towards a declarative uh, um, model right here. And we're doing an upgrade to Envoy. And so with Envoy, we are going to have a service control uh, mesh sidecar that sits alongside, right? And instead of Nginx and HA proxy, we're going to use Envoy over Quick. And we have a declarative service catalog. So in this case, we just have users specify, hey, I'm this role. I want to talk to that role. And in doing this, we not only are able to kind of be able to configure service, um, uh, the service mesh, but we're also able to kind of configure our firewall rules as well, right? And so we're able to do things, once again, that are kind of um, above and beyond what people are expecting by just kind of expressing, what is the state of the world that you want, right? And moving forward, where we kind of like move to Spiffy and Spire, we'll be able to kind of set up uh, authentication for these people. And um, our end users aren't going to have to like do anything. They'll just have to specify that once. So don't repeat yourself. And it creates kind of like this auto migration. Now, the last piece here that I kind of like want to emphasize here is kind of like building with empathy. And in this case, um, the phrase kind of is like, eat your own dog food. I prefer kind of drink your own champagne. And this is kind of like vital. I think that you need to have your platform teams using your services. We've seen platform teams that don't do that. They, get, they drift and they don't understand what the needs are for our end customers. One of the reasons that our uh, adoption rate was so fast with MySQL was that we actually were using it for months before we kind of gave it to our end customers. So we had worked out all of the kinks and all of the sharp edges. And another thing here is that um, you have to listen to your customers. So in this case, oftentimes platforms isn't going off and building something revolutionary or new. Um, we're just listening to what our customers needs and then coming up with solutions to make sure that we're solving their particular problems. So we're engaging early, we're following up while we're building, and we're checking in at multiple points to make sure that what we're building it, it's, um, is actually the right thing. And we value feedback over opinion. So all of, our, all of my teams kind of have weekly or uh, bi-weekly or monthly check-ins with the major business units to kind of ensure that we are building the right thing for our customers. A concept that uh, um, I like to think of is hospitality over service. And this was a concept that was actually introduced by a gentleman named Danny Mayer. And so Danny Mayer is actually a restaurateur. Um, and he owns, uh, he started with a restaurant in, in New York City. And he's consistently viewed as kind of like one of the top, his restaurants are consistently viewed as some of the top restaurants in New York City. Now, it's not because he has the best food. But one thing that he really focused on early on in his career is this notion of hospitality. So service is getting the, is, is what you expect kind of given to you. So getting your food, the right food, is service. Having like um, a host seat you is service. That's like expected. Hospitality would be to like come into a restaurant and somebody remember you by name and then kind of remember that, oh, you like that particular um, Riesling, right? Let me get you a glass. And, and what, before they get to the table, right? And so hospitality is present when something happens for you. It's absent when something happens to you. Those simple prepositions, for and to, express it all. And so in this light, I ask you, is your platform doing something for or to your customers? People hate the platform doing something to you, and they will love a platform that does something for them. So how does this manifest, for instance, right? So um, we have an IQ bot that goes off, and then any time that we get um, 500s on our public API, historically what would happen is that 
the API team would get page. They would have to go run some queries, right? They would go reach, um, have to go off and try to like page the, the existing teams and such, right? And it always felt to the teams that there's something was happening um, kind of to them. But now we have this IQ bot that will automatically react and respond. And so the second an alert comes on with um, an excessive amount of pages um, of 500s that are coming in through a public API, we'll go and then we can determine like what endpoints are being affected, in this case recordings. And then we get this little graph that's kind of like, um, that will come up in our Slack interface, right? So when people log on, they get the page and they log into um, um, our on-call room, they know exactly what's going on and they know exactly where to go and look kind of consider to start thinking and treating your customers as paying customers. And so in this case, what's this mean? Like UX is important. Just because it's an internal tool doesn't mean like you forego UX. Treat platform outages with the same scrutiny as your product outages. Um, this, I think, is really important. Um, sometimes you'll see that platform, um, platform organizations will not treat their outages. Um, they go, oh, it's just internal. We don't have to kind of do this. No, like, go deep dive. Do, your, do rigorous postmortems, right? Like, we have some systems that have to have higher availability than the rest of Twilio. Like, for instance, the API proxy or um, our service mesh. These are, um, these are like five, nine systems, right? And so they're core um, day one, day zero kind of systems. And so we hold like rigorous postmortems whenever um, an incident occurs on them. And the other thing is just to kind of consider is that your engineering's time is super valuable. If you can reduce the amount of time and make their lives easier, do that. Wasting their time and blocking them does matter. Another way that we track this is like via an NPS. So an NPS, for those that don't know, is like a net promoter score. And um, so we run an NPS um, internally, so not just for external customers. We give it to our, all of our engineers um, every quarter. And so basically, we ask them nine questions every quarter. I can effectively build my software. I can effectively deliver my software to dev stage and prod. Um, I can measure the operational metrics of my services. And I, for instance, I have platform tools that are consistently improving. And we ask them on a scale of 1 to 10 to rate um, how they feel about this. And if they not, they would recommend this to a friend. And, and the way that NPS works is that you take the percentage of promoters, which are your 9s and 10s, you take out the 7s and the 8s, which you view as passive, and then you subtract the 0 through 6s. So you can get on a scale of like negative 100 to 100 in this, in this model, right? So when we started back in four years ago, we had an NPS score of like a negative 59, right? And now we are at like an NPS score of 20. Really anything over zero is viewed as good, um, but we have aspirations to get this up in obviously higher, but like we're, we're targeting like 50, which would be excellent. We also have kind of like bots or Slack bot NPSs. So what this is is that like when people use a particular service um, and such like our deployment systems or they have something remediated or anytime they're using a tool, we instrument those tools to kind of go and re report. And Slack will go out and like reach out to them and ask them to rate on a scale of 1 to 10 how their experience was. And out of this, we actually get a lot of great feedback. So. In this case, this is like a, a positive um, thing, but there's still some feedback there. It's like, hey, we want this kind of like to be able to work with my Zookeeper cluster. So uh, thank you very much. <laughs> I'm not going to butcher it. Um, um, thank you very much. That was kind of like the end of my presentation. And I want to thank you for joining me this afternoon. And I hope you learn more about platforms at Twilio and how we make our engineers' lives easier and better. And in closing, I ask that you consider an API first um, to approach when you're building your platforms, that you start thinking self-service and adopt it in your organization. Remember the power of declarative platforms. And last but not least, build with empathy. And if you're a platform engineer, please remember that how important your role is. You have an opportunity to like, make the lives of your other, other engineers better each and every day, and you are a rate multiplier. And please remember that no piece of technology um, is a magic bullet, but adopting some of all these principles, I, I can guarantee that you'll make a difference in your organization, make engineers more effective, and make them feel like this guy. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, Justin. That was awesome. 
Uh, there are some great takeaway messages there. Kosanam. Yeah, <laughs> Kosanam, yes. So we have uh, a few minutes for the questions. You should uh, all hit up slido.com, uh, upvote your favorite questions, or send them, send uh, your own ones. And after the Q&A session, you will be able to rate this talk on Slido. So let's begin. OK. Let's start with this one uh, at the bottom. How do you handle version com compatibility with so many releases? That's an interesting question. So each, well, every, every API rig that goes out, you have to be backward compatible. Like, that's just kind of like the gist of it, right? And so um, with this, you have cluster tests, and you have integration tests, and you have um, unit tests that hopefully that should assert this right before you're kind of going out to production. Um, so uh, in general, yeah, just thinking kind of backward compatibility. And remember, we're only doing one layer of the cake at a time. On that note, how, uh, do you manually approve 100 deploys a day? If no. not, <laughs> how does that, of course not. <laughs> if not, how does the business assert a user story is implemented, how they wanted it? That's a great question. Um, so no, we don't, um, we don't um, deploy 100 times a day. In terms of the business, once again, the teams are empowered to be autonomous, right? So internally, um, in your definition of done, when you're building your story, you should kind of have like what are the automated tests that we're going to do to kind of prove or disprove this kind of story and such, right? And so that is something that is, once again, a responsibility that is pushed down to the end teams. Um, but I, I, one of the things that's kind of like aligned here and is teams are, uh, are intimately aware of like their customers. So you're trying to kind of do right to your customer. And so you're trying to do the right thing. And by giving teams this autonomy and authority, um, Ideally, uh, they have a, that sense of um, um, uh, accountability and that these are their customers and they're doing the right thing. So there's not like a centralized product management that's kind of asserting and saying like, hey, you've got to build it this way. No, that's coming up from like within. This all goes back to Conway's law, I guess, right? Pardon? It all goes back to Conway's law, yeah. I guess. All right, so the next question is, why do you have your own API definition structure? Why don't you just use Open API and uh, Swagger code gen? It's a good question. Yes. So, um, in terms of the, when this was first developed, like this was developed um, a, a while ago, and the API is pretty vast, and so the code generation was not going to be actually sufficient using kind of like um, uh, Swag Swagger's code gen um, capabilities, right? Um, in terms of there was actually more metadata as well that was needed for this than kind of like what Swagger kind of like developed. And the team just felt like, hey, let's kind of just distill the information that we need, right, and have a tool that we can kind of build and modify and, and tweak in our own ways, right? So we don't necessarily just do code gen from this. All of our docs are also generated from like our API gens. I, I took out some slides about like our, we're actually uh, GDPR compliant, and all of our docs uh, that there's metadata in the in the um, uh, inner API definitions, and they kind of get transposed into uh, um, our, their end customer docs about which fields are GDPR compliant and um, what is the, the the time that we retain some these um, PI data. Thank you. I was also wondering about that. So, how often develop, uh, do devel developers switch from one team to another? Is it allowed? Oh, absolutely. I think that that's like critical, and that kind of like also helps to build this empathy. Um, you're not allowed to just kind of switch like every two months or th every three months, right? But like the idea here is um, you want, uh, so for instance, I've had um, my engineers go over to like voice teams or like our new flex teams, right? I've had um, data platform engineers come into my org. I've had voice um, engineers coming into my org, right? And so really um, the, the idea here is that Every time that you switch a team, you just see a different perspective. And in doing so, um, you just learn, right? And I think that that is one of um, something that's also embedded in the company is just to be a growth organization and, and, and learn as much as possible. Thanks. OK, we have still uh, a little time for a couple of questions. What is your process for team deprecation? That's interesting. Um, yeah. In terms of like, so uh, there was a question that was kind of asked about like, what happens like, for instance, when we, a team has too many services, like they've gotten like maybe too successful. That would be like this mitosis situation that will occur, right, um, when they split. Within business units, you can always take a look and say like, hey, are these teams organized correctly or can we organize them better? 
Um, so it's not necessarily like a strict mitosis that one goes to two and so on and so forth, right? Oftentimes, sometimes like teams will kind of go and look and say like, hey, you know what? Even in that business unit, this functionality looks to be kind of similar, right? Um, there's not a true um, way, one process in which it happens, right? But usually what happens is that there's, um, we meet operationally once a week as an engineering org. And this is where we will review our kind of like key SLOs, metrics, and we call it ops review. And in that meeting, um, we are keeping in check and like the architects kind of have a visibility over like what the other teams are doing and such, right? And so that's like an opportunity that we can kind of say like, hey, maybe these teams should be things or that should be broken up and let's move it over there, right, and such, right? But usually what we try to do is kind of like align incentives as much as possible. Um, uh, on that note, how actually how many services do you have? Uh, so we have uh, 1,500 active server roles, right? Um, oh and then in terms of um, actual services within that, I, like I, you know, that's a great question. Um, less than that, like maybe okay. 800 or so. All right, we have run out of time. I'm sorry, guys, for the other questions. I'm, I hope uh, Justin will be available to answer them after the talk. In a few minutes, we are going to be back with uh, Victor Farcic and Kubernetes. And uh, thanks, Justin Kitagawa, for this amazing talk. Everyone, just give it up for Justin. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.